Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. We are here at Wild Arrow, and we're gonna we're gonna visit with you guys again, uh, Jeremiah Cody. We're gonna talk about uh, lighted knocks today. A little bit about lighted knocks because we we love them. I love them. It's a love hate. Cody makes it's fun a, of them. It's a, a love bit. hate. Yeah. Uh, Love but, hate. But before we do that, I want to get into a uh, sub- couple questions we got on the last podcast. And one of them was around the uh, boning heat veins that you talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy writes, uh, man, I've been shooting the boning heat veins since they came out. And in my experience, hands down, the best veins out there. Then now the Arizona Easy Fletch has a three-inch arm with a six-degree helical. Holy cow, friggin' laser beams out to 100 yards all day, even with big, nasty, fixed-blade broadheads. Well done, gritty, great show. Do you cool. agree? Do you concur? Yeah, it can be done. So, you know, with, with if you're running that heat vein, like the same, same mm-hmm. concept he's talking about right here. It's that right there. Yeah, yeah. that's the build. So. If he if you got a bow that has perfect knock travel and that thing you know you've, you've your arrows are spine aligned all that it can definitely be done but what we do we do get a little bit of pushback from certain customers on that that uh, may, maybe they're not making perfect shots you know torquing the bow or their bow's not perfectly tuned mm-hmm. I do feel like some of these veins do have a hard time controlling some of the bigger fixed blades like the you know the Q80 Exodus. We get a little bit of fifty fifty feedback on that from customers. Now, okay. if a guy runs like, oh geez, a smaller cut like a striker, it, it may be a three blade, but down to a one and a sixteenth or a one inch cut. Really, haven't heard any negative feedback on that yet. No, so, they fly good. Expandables yeah. and smaller fixed blades um, is what we recommend. Is, usually with yeah, this. and then and if it's, if a guy's going to run a Valkyrie, he's running the two hundred grain point up front um, in a Jaeger. He He's going to be a 50-50. We usually will give him two options. Go tell us what shoots the best. We'll fletch it with that. Yeah. One customer swears by that. The next guy's like, eh, got a little bit tighter group with maybe that same vein, but in a four fletch with just a mild offset. Okay. Um, I think so. I think what it really boils down to is, I mean, you know, the broadhead is one thing because you're the, the more surface area you put out there, usually the more vein surface area, but, you know, your FOC, but... I think it's more based off the individual's bow. Maybe a guy shooting an older like single cam that doesn't have good knock travel, that's a heck of a lot harder to get that arrow to stabilize coming out versus mm-hmm. if you're shooting a new Vertex with perfect knock travel, he can get away with a little bit more, I feel like. Explain so. knock travel. So a lot of guys have the perception that when you draw your bow back, that from the static position to the full draw position, that arrow comes back perfectly square, and that is... So far from the truth. <laughs> so right, yeah. They a lot meaning of, that the cams pull it back and it comes back exactly. Yeah. So on a perfect horizontal flat, line. Perfect horizontal line. Yeah. But you have you have two knock positions that shift. Not only will you have a vertical shift, but you can have a horizontal shift too, yep. which is cam lean. Yep. And so riser flex and cam lean. Riser flex cam lean. So yeah, it, uh, that that's a big misconception. So we get we'll like we'll tune certain guys' bows, like maybe it's an older single cam with a QAD rest, like Matthews Z seven. We have this fight this all the time where that bow, because of the knock travel, wants to it starts high as it comes down, it wants to pull that arrow low. So we have to we do have to start the knocking point higher on the string just to get that bow to tune. But then the guy gets his bow and he knocks it and his arrow's not level, it looks up and he, we get that phone call all the time, like, Hey, I just have my bow tuned from you. But it, it looks way off to me. And we're like, <laughs> then, you know, yeah. go th- we explain that it's over and over. It's not perfectly so. 90 or the arrow's not perfectly in the right, middle of the right. rest. It's just. Yeah, yeah. If you've not shot a bow often, you right. know, especially if you're new and your arrow's sitting on the, yeah. on the bow, like pointed downward. Yeah, like, there's there's tolerances. There, I mean, there's there's a, a range that's acceptable. Mm-hmm. Once you get outside that range, then yeah. then start questioning things. But even manufacturers have a, a, a pretty wide range. You'd be surprised at how wide you can have because everybody's so different, right? You could have your rest an inch out off of yeah. the riser for center shot, or you could have it in clear into where... Oh, I had some clearance. weird stuff back <laughs> in the day, you know, 10, 12 years ago, where, you know, to get it to tune to shoot bullet holes, um, you know, my arrow is cockeyed, mm-hmm. pointing down, like to the left or right. Like, well, back <laughs> then they had so right. many limb issues that they had to tiller tune the bows all the time, right? So it's <laughs> right. like, hey, I'm um, shooting knock high. Well, I'm going to back that top limb out a little bit. And mm-hmm. so, yep. yeah, back then we, there was all kinds of stuff you had to do to get those bows to shoot straight. But 
You know, one of the things, I mean, I learned a lot from Cody when, you know, when he came back working from, from Hoyt and, uh, ran warranty and he was showing me the specs and the guidelines of what they were saying was acceptable. I had a hard time uh, coming to terms with that, bro. I'm yeah. like, there's no way. I'm there's like, no way I'm that like, Jay, work. it could go from <laughs> negative. Now, mind you, knock low, uh-huh. right? 16th or so knock low all the way up to three sixteenths knock high. And he's like, yeah. no, eighth is as high as I'm going. Yeah. And I'm like, three sixteenths yeah. is fine. <laughs> yeah, matter of <laughs> it's fact. With, I it's had within a, spec. So. What was it? My, I think I had a spider turbo that wanted to tune lock low and – it was the hardest thing for yeah. me to come, but I, I'm like, oh, he's like, just do it. I'm like, all right, I'm and I like, set up and shoot it, and that thing shot great, yeah, even like, with fixed blades. But mm. that bow, with that knock travel, whatever it wanted, it tuned yep. a little knock low, and that's where yeah. it wanted to be. So, okay, so um, the other question that we got, moving moving on, uh, yeah. this guy asked about the fletchings, and he said three vein or four vein for, for, and you guys are, it's a three fletch, just to clarify, with this with that jig with. Okay, right. yeah, yeah. but do you recommend three or four fletch with with these arrows it, or with these uh, veins? This this is what I would tell someone if they're asking is just build build three and three and yeah. go see what shoots best for your yep. setup. So last year um, the setup that I ran was was a four fletch heat, not in a steep helical. It was just four veins and a slight offset. Mm-hmm. And I went from running a mechanical here in Utah. For deer and elk to Idaho, where I had to run to, I had to go to a fixed blade for hunting Idaho. So, and I hadn't even, I hadn't even shot a fixed blade. I just shot my mechanicals all summer long. And then I seriously get to, get to camp in Idaho, set up my trailer, throw my target out there, thread on some fixed blades. And I went out and shot all the way to 80 yards, no problem whatsoever. So with that four fletch combo, it, the more vein you have here, the more forgiveness you have on the front of the shaft. So the more options you can usually run. When you start mm-hmm. to play around with reducing vein size on the back side, that's where things can get squirrely. So you have to check that setup. So maybe that one guy that commented earlier, hey, I, I shot a bigger three-blade fixed or a four-blade fixed, bigger cut, and they shot great. His setup, his bow, loved it. Gotcha. But the next guy, he's going to go tell his buddy that that doesn't have a bow that – fires the same and he tries it and goes man my result wasn't yeah. the same so when in doubt more fletching will stabilize mm-hmm. it for sure but if you're trying to re- get that happy medium between wind and drag and that sort of thing you kind of have to play with multiple setups to find your yeah, your right. spot right stream foc right you, you, you're yeah we to... do a lot with this which is a, a boning blazer x2 mm-hmm. in a four fletch yep. um as well to okay. to get the optimal between that that happy medium between drag and also stability. I like the bear shaft idea we talked about. Just heavy FOC and bear shaft. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No just veins. Have it be no fletching. No veins and have you don't it just need be them. like perfectly tuned. Yeah. Yep. yep. I agree. <laughs> I'm gonna try. <laughs> I, I'm doing. I, we did it the one year. I had a, a bunch of arrows where the fletchings fell off uh, up at that Salt Creek range. We were shooting 3D, and all my veins had fallen off my shaft. Poor poor glue job. Poor prepping. <laughs> L- l- hurry and sound dirty licking stick yeah yeah. Right. yeah they fell off but the the buffalo was at 128 and i'm like i'm just gonna lob one just <laughs> just to see right and that arrow did not look pretty in flight but it hit vitals at 128 no fletching so mm, it's possible it's possible he likes more distance on the site that way he gets clearance. i get clearance right <laughs> i shoot that baby draw length i need the clearance yeah. okay is this so here's the here's an here's a question that got that we touched on just to touch uh, by Knights of the Apex on uh, Instagram. He says, uh, appreciate you guys having different points of view on the podcast. The whole baseball with a string or semi pulling a trailer are great analogies for FOC, but they are almost always used in a manner that highlights the advantages of the setup without acknowledging the obvious disadvantages. The greatest force propelling an arrow comes from behind it, not in front. The notion that a broadhead pulls an arrow makes for a good image, but that's just not how physics work, unless that broadhead has an engine and propeller. Now, imagine trying to throw a baseball by the string end or driving that semi from the rear end of the tractor trailer. It would be a pain. Well, that is what steering a high FOC arrow is like. These setups have advantages, but they are also much more difficult to tune than a balanced setup. Like every piece of gear in archery, there is a give and take. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I don't know that. Uh, from my experience with tuning with those, I've I've had no problem. 
And so, you know, and the, a lot of guys will, will say that, hey, you've been running 8% FOC, and once you get that arrow perfectly balanced and get everything square, we've been able to shoot, you know, solid groups, especially with, with fixed blades. But I don't know. I have, I've yet to see a disadvantage for me or hear a disadvantage from customer feedback when we built a high FOC setup. So right. until yeah. I get a guy come in here that tells me otherwise, like right. I mean, I'm you, going off of a lot of a lot of guys' right. feedback. Yeah, right? science, science is science. We can argue science back and forth so many different ways, right? This this scientist has this opinion. Mm-hmm. You know, just like with trucks, that engineer feels like that truck's motor's the best. This guy feels like this motor's the best, right? And so we've got a couple guys that that I know um, in the industry that that shoot. Um, really really well whether it's Mm -hmm. under pressure or at animals they both kill a lot of stuff every one of them from back in the day before foc was really even talked about they were taking metal um rods from like a a home depot or a lowe's or store cutting them down and gluing them behind their inserts years ago because they saw the benefits of foc FOC, right now if you're talking 60 yards and in or maybe even 50 yards and in a balanced setup shoots really well i've shot really well with foc um but i feel like those that longer 60 maybe a little bit plus i feel like i've shot better groups with at least some more weight up front now i'm talking like an extra 50 grains like instead of a 100 grain broadhead I throw either a gold tip fact weight or something or a heavier insert. Mm-hmm. 50 grains um, has been a standard for a long time with guys that, that are out there. There's a few guys that publicize some stuff in articles, that write articles, and that they'll say the same thing. I've been reading it for years. A little bit better FOC helps tune groups, broadhead flight tighter the longer you get out. And so, yeah. yeah. Until, I until I go out and, and set one up and go, I've never had one set up like Jay said that was like, FOC just screwed my group. Like it was great. I threw weight in it and it got worse. I've generally seen it get tighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I. You know, if I were to take a spear that was balanced across the board, right, from end to end, and I were to throw that, I imagine it would throw fairly well. Yeah, especially if I threw it right. Right, but if it's got foc on it and i throw it i feel like i'm gonna get more penetration i mean there's not a spear on the planet that cavemen that, have used that's, that's balanced not, that's that's not right. it that doesn't have an intense foc i was right. actually thinking about this earlier today and, and, before and that's that. all an arrow a is, spear. is a mini it's spear. a mini spear yeah it's it exactly like the same the other th- issue is the the I have yet to experience that it's more difficult to tune an extreme FOC arrow than because that's the argument that that uh, Knights of the Apex makes that you know trying to throw a baseball by the string end it's it's that's an analogy right it, to, you know we all know that this arrow shaft is not it's stiffer than a string right it's, it still can propel it. right that's why I think Brent Hahn calls it an a broadhead delivery system, right? The, the the whole setup because it's it's not quite a string, right? It's not a tractor trailer uh, analogy either. Well, yeah. because that trailer isn't pushing it for sure, but it's stiffer than it's got a certain amount of stiffness to right. deliver that broadhead just enough that it needs to to send it. But once it's out there, the comment was that. Um, you know, these setups have advantages, but they're much more difficult to tune than a balanced setup. I I don't think that this is not a balanced setup. It's a balanced setup with extreme FOC. Right. With a purpose. You're not yeah. you're not taking it so far. It's not fifty percent FOC. Now if you took it too far, yeah, I think you run into a lot of variables and that's where Brent did the testing that mm-hmm. he's done is I think there's a happy medium. I mean, for for me it's like Go go give a football to somebody, a standard football, right, that's very balanced, right, and have them throw it. Half of them can't throw a spiral because they don't know how. But then hand them that Nerf football that was just a football right. and wings on the yeah. back. Every single one of them could huck it a mile. Comes a pro. It recovers really yeah. quickly, it, <laughs> uh, right? I mean, it's it's not the greatest analogy in the world, but it, it makes sense in my mind when it's done mm-hmm. correctly. So what were you going to say, Jeremiah? So one thing that, that when we talk that analogy a lot is – what you have to keep in mind is the arrow itself already acts as a tail rudder, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you when you get an arrow with high FOC and that weight is pulling, is again, if I can get it to come out, like I'll shoot a perfect bear shaft 
through paper. And it looks like a pinhole go through there. And then I can make sure that that, that arrow is leaving my boat so perfectly. Mm-hmm. And the reason we can get bear shafts to fly in group is because this arrow, if you get it to leave the boat so perfectly, so square, without veins, the back of the shaft already still acts as a little bit of a tail rudder. If it, if it moves to the side, it gets air that pushes against it to tr- straighten it, balance it out, right? And the only thing we're doing is with, with the back of the arrow, when we add veins, is just creating a little bit bigger of a rudder back there. And so the more rudder you have back here, the more it stabilizes what's going on up here. But again, when we run that the higher front and center systems and... And I think most of their builds are going 20% if, if we had to put a number mm-hmm, on it. Mm-hmm. That weight forward, it just it makes that back end just steer a little bit better. And so, I don't know. Yeah, hey, I, remember I, making a paper airplane? Yeah. Right? And then you put like a paper clip. On the front. And oh, and yeah. And it front, made the fly better. And all of a yeah. sudden, it's like that thing will just go. Right. Right. It, just enough. Yeah. But if it's just perfectly balanced, the thing just kind of it has a mind of it. It can own. be moved a lot quicker. Right. Yeah. So like Jay said, the tail rudder thing, if it's got weight up here and this is being pushed around, this weight up here kind of resists. Like if there's nothing on the front and I blow on the back end of this arrow, that right. front's going to move rather quickly. Well, that's why I, when I heard that, um, you know, it's he, stating that the broadhead doesn't pull the arrow because physics doesn't work that way unless it has an engine or a prop. But, but I don't see the back of the arrow being the driver for the broadhead either because you're launching the entire shaft. Right. Yes. The, the head is launching at the same time as the back. Right. It's not the back of the arrow pushing it. The whole thing absorbed the energy from yeah. the bow. Right. The whole thing is moving. And then as it moves, what keeps it on track? The veins or the head? Yep. And it, I feel like that's where FOC keeps it on track. Right. The physics yep. behind it are that that head is, in effect – pulling the rest of the shaft behind yeah. it yeah because it's what where the mom, the the bulk of the weight is therefore it is what ends up Pull. doing the work yeah, yep. yeah. so yeah i think I'm not doing sure, the work's a good way I'm, to put it yeah i'm not sure it's that the analogy that I, i'm no i'm no physicist but all i know is this is what i said <laughs> the other day is look the arrow blows through the wind, blows through the brush, yep. and it does insane yep. penetration. Right. So those, yep. I, the black box is whatever it is. I just know that the out, you know, what, h- however it works. I, I don't know the details. I just know that it does work. It works. So. Yep. Huh. yep. Yeah. I, you know, just kind of looking back at some of the different setups I've ran, and I, I think when guys are starting to dabble with that, if they don't run a high enough FOC, there's, I think there's a tipping point. Of where Brent it starts Hans to steer. Twenty percent. Exactly. Yeah. He and says if you're under twenty percent, he's like, "There's really no difference, right? In in, in running a uh, a five percent FOC or a nine eighteen percent FOC head, you're not going to see the difference. Right. You get above twenty, and you will start to see all those benefits we're talking. Right. About. Yeah. That's yeah. when it. And I would agree with Brent because he's done more testing. I've learned a lot from him on this, but. I would agree that that's where that arrow starts to pull. So maybe a guy has an arrow that it's 8%, mm-hmm. and then he bumps up and goes to 16, and he's like, man, that was a huge increase. But he's still not quite Having a there. hard time getting yeah, into tune. He's not there yet. All that, yeah. Plus, the other thing that, that you'd have to kind of be careful on is what type of arrow you're trying to build that system with. And so there's certain arrows that don't recover as fast out of the bow. And so... You know, if an arrow takes longer time to stabilize coming out of the bow, right. he might his groups might do this because it breaks down the spine of that shaft. If it's then, not a good spine aligned arrow, yeah, and that arrow's I, I that arrow's gonna fly like a wet affect. noodle. That yeah. arrow's still trying yeah. to recover, and so he's like, "Geez, yeah. I threw weight up front. My arrow it broke down the spine, and when I fired, my arrow never recovered. It still was uh, it paradoxing clear uh-huh. down range, yeah. and then you're gonna see this shotgun effect of your group where your group opens up and you go, yeah. well, well, that didn't work. You good. gotta spine it right for the weight you're throwing out the front. And, and guys, if they're trying that, I really, I think it's really key to go to a, a light stiff arrow. If you're trying to do it with with certain arrows that just, I, there's certain arrows that I've shot that don't recover as quickly out of the bow, and so. Yeah, I think you know some of those guys that maybe have dabbled with that. If they just had the current arrow and they're like, "Hey, I'm going to go. I'm just going to throw weight on the front of this and see what happens," they might not be getting the full effect of the FOC, and so they're getting negative results. Going, you get the shotgun effect, but yeah, because it took me a minute to think about it. Going, man, that's I've tried some of that in the past, and I have noticed that where 
I call it the shotgun effect where you're aiming the pins on and your arrow's not hitting behind the pin. You're going, all right, why am I getting this bat? You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think guys yeah. need to make sure they're, they're using the correct arrow. And, you know, I think that'll yeah. make a big difference. So yeah. uh, now you guys uh, sent me a picture yesterday, Cody did, of this, of this, uh, photo that's circulating. Yeah. You know, in, in the social sphere. And it's a bull elk where there's an arrow sticking through like maybe the last rib. Right. And it looks like that arrow may have been, may have been in, in, in him for a couple months now. Yeah, it looks like it's. It looks like he can. It came through winter, so he got it, hit. Yep. Made it. Looks like he made it through winter. It looks. Like and and you don't know how long the arrow is. I mean, right. the guy could be a thirty-six inch. You know. Right. You know, whatever. <laughs> right. But yeah. But uh, it looks like it's just in. I don't know, four inches maybe. How far? Yeah. Maybe? Doesn't look like a whole lot. There's yeah. a lot of arrows sticking out. Right. There's a lot of arrows sticking out. Yeah. And he, he. This is a game camera photo. Right. And he's just kind of cruising around. And yep. so, what are your thoughts on that? Well, what happened? Because that is a textbook shot. The angle looked It perfect. looked really good right. um, from the angle. Grant, I mean, as long as there wasn't any deflection that happened or it was coming in straight and then Two it questions. What, you know, what do you think happened? And two, do you think the bull will survive? Um, it, it, I think the bull, he looked fine. I mean, his demeanor looked fine. Granted, this is trail camera pictures, but... Um, from what we've seen, I, I, I'd put money on maybe that bull's living. Like, as agree. long as he doesn't get any gangrenous stuff where there was, um, any of the, it was just back and maybe he got some gut stuff or he got some of that bile stuff out into, um, just out into his cavity. I bet you he would live. Yeah. But if that bull, say that bull got hit in September and right. now we're coming all, you know, if that's a, that new photo that was posted at springtime. Yeah. If, he, if I think if that bull made it through the winter, if he would have had bile, I think that he would have. By now. Expired. Yeah. So I bet you he's. I, I think he, I think there's a really high you know chance that, that bull's going to survive, honestly. So yeah. we've, we've heard, we've seen multiple customers come in here with photos of animals that they've killed that have had wounds from broadheads or even muzzleloaders. We've seen a guy that had a, a bull that he killed that had a muzzleloader slug right in his shoulder, and they didn't even get through that. So Tell me um, that experience about the one that had a broadhead in its yeah. heart. So the the craziest thing I've ever seen, and, and you know we've seen a lot, but a friend of mine killed a bull in Idaho several years back, and he, he killed on a rifle hunt. And uh, where they killed it, they were able to actually get a – a ranger pretty close to it and so they're like hey we're gonna we're gonna take the whole thing out of here so anyway they they got the animal and uh, as he cuts through the dime frame he's trying to pull out the the vitals and something kind of pokes him in his hand and he kind of what the heck is that and he starts cutting up in there and and uh anyway he pulls the heart out and in the bottom of the heart and where the lobe comes down there's a broad head and about six inches of arrow that had been in there and it healed over like it wasn't from that year it was yeah. You know, years it previous, had calloused over, it had pretty calloused good. over, yeah. and uh, calcified. Almost. Yeah, you know, kills this bull, and so <laughs> I, we're so just it like, pierced the lung and into the I don't, heart. Or? I don't know if that one got lung or not. It looked okay. pretty low, so I wonder if it just came into you know that okay. bottom angle. But yeah, to, to see a heart with a broadhead in it and arrow that's calcified, and that bull still living, like I'm just going, man. These, I mean, we always say these animals are tough, but that that just raised yeah. the bar, you know. Yeah. And so, do you know if it was a frontal shot? From you know what the, angle that that thing came in at? So from the angle, it looked like it looked like it did come in from a like a quartering the, away. It was quartering away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it looked to me like I would have took that shot all yeah. day long. Almost like the same mm. angle that bull that we just looked at on that trail camera, right? Yeah. It's like that quartering away. But, yeah, that yeah. yeah. It, it looked yeah quartering away. Uh, that that bull on the trail camera was quartering away, and it um it looks like a money shot. Like it would look like if you got full penetration shooting a Valkyrie, it would have <laughs> it would have went. Offside shoulder, like that right. aim spot looked great. What as far as what happened? Mm-hmm. Poundage is a factor. Don't know how far the shot was. Don't know what poundage that individual was shooting. Don't know what broadhead style that individual arrow was shooting. Arrow yield. Um, arrow yield. I mean, we've had we've had a customer that uh, that was a big a big fellow. He's played professional football. I mean, he's a big dude. Shoots a ninety pound bow. Uh, an older hoy, we custom bill at 90 pounds for him from the factory. 32 inch draw. 32 inch draw length. 90 pounds. Shooting a yeah. 600 and something grain arrow, right? Mm-hmm. But the biggest thing he failed on, he's like, I've got the energy, I got this. The biggest thing he skimped on was the business end. He bought Walmart yep. broadheads, shot a deer, <laughs> yes. shot a deer, small mule deer, not giant, just a 
little three point mule deer at like 15 feet head on thought I have enough energy to do it shoots this and when he hit it that mushroom that broadhead mushroomed like a bullet and just disintegrated and he got six inches if that of penetration never killed it so I would never maybe found, you never ne- found never it. found yeah, it never right. nothing right and so it's like with that elk what happened I don't I don't know what type of broadhead was it like could it energy of the bow the maybe that was my biggest thinking is man you shoot and you yeah. you know that arrow's coming out and you hit some brush and that arrow gets loses bumped so off much loses momentum so much energy yeah, yeah. that arrow it looks not straight I mean yeah. it looks horizontally straight it's not yeah. Sa- yeah. it's in far enough to where the arrow's not sagging yeah it's not. I mean, Grant's a still photo. Maybe it could be flopping as he's moving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, it's just mind-boggling to me. There's a book I read on blood tracking with dogs, and there's a the gentleman who wrote it. I think he'd been on more than 700 blood tracking um, experiences, whitetail country, right. a, a part of the United Blood Trackers Association or organization online. And, you know, he'd had these dogs, but he'd been on a lot of – jobs and from his experience any animal any deer that's that's been hit in the in the front cavity you know in front of that whether it's liver diaphragm mostly low the forward right uh, lungs and heart especially any animal hit in that area that doesn't hemorrhage he said will survive Really? Will survive. It's, it's like if they don't bleed to death in general, they're, right. they have such a capacity to overcome infection uh, up front and such capacity to, to heal. Right. That as long as they don't bleed to death, they will, even if there's an arrow sticking out of them, whatever, they, their bodies will just kind of adapt and they'll be fine. Yeah. Anything behind the diaphragm that gets hit, he said, is like 90, 95% fatal. It just might take a month. It might right. take, take six time. months, but it's almost always Interesting. Fatal. Yeah. I would agree. Well, I would agree think with about that. it, evolutionary speaking, if in order for me to procreate, I have to stab someone to death with something on top of my head in order to do that, <laughs> I think I would develop the, the ability to heal myself pretty right. well. Yeah. You know, shooting a broadhead into an elk is nothing like having a big old rut fight. How many times oh, have geez. we heard of bulls I mean, the guy's pulled out seven, eight inches of antler in a face yeah, of another yeah. bull. Um, they go through so much more than what we're throwing a little broadhead at. How many guys, you know, hit a bull high in that no zone, right? They see the bull rutting cows the next day like it's nothing. He's like, right. yeah, just brush that one off, you know. Yep. And so uh, yeah. We were after when my cousin Ben shot a bull uh, a couple years back. We watched two bulls you know come out of this canyon and they were just pissed at each other i've never seen such intense rutting activity and uh the one bull had a horn on the right side and the main beam on the left was busted off and his eyeball was gouged oh. out completely gone and just this giant pus like thing was going all the way down his neck and down his leg and just this gaping moon and he was rutting and chasing cows with this monstrosity of a hole in his face <laughs> right. and he, that had been, he's blind right. and he'd been like that for a couple of weeks and it didn't even phase him he didn't care and yeah. then the other bull ironically had been broken with his main beam on the opposite side i wondered if they got stuck and yeah. just snapped each other's beams off right. that's on, so much force <laughs> and that's crazy so he's busted on the opposite side and the side where his main beam is missing He's got four inches of horn jammed into his shoulder. And, and they're just smacking each other, geez. smacking oh, each dude, other with the one horn. <laughs> they're, they're, <laughs> and he's just going to war with two horned bulls, even though he's only got one. You know yeah, he's going right. to get freaking stabbed. Popeye every against Popeye. Time. Right. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. Wow. He's already one loses his, his eyeball, and the other one just has a, antlers busted off yeah, his right. shoulders. Yeah. He's just like, I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. So I think, I think that, um, especially elk. They, they, they're, they're just tough and resilient, but I look at that arrow though, in, in all these cases, and I, I'm not seeing, you know, still the jury's out, but f- right now I'm not seeing like that, that Valkyrie system stopping. Right. You know, when, when we, when we shoot, like you said, you with your wife quartering to steep angle, she's still able to get a full pass through right. with her little draw, little weight set up. 
you know yeah it's impressive i it's, yeah i mean if you know if she can if she can do it with her little setup man just you know, we go back to our customer as a football player. Like, imagine what he could do with that. You know, it's like <laughs> we do sh- have a customer. We do have a customer that just came in. We we reset up his, his. He came to get his wife a bow and and stuff. And so we we were uh, just talking to him about uh, his Valkyrie system, how it's going and stuff. And he's like, I have three Reinhardt targets, which mm-hmm. are really tough targets, f- strapped together, and I'm going out the last one yeah. at sixty yards. Yeah, with his Valkyrie, he's eighty plus pounds, six hundred grand arrow, like almost three hundred feet per second. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, I, I and I don't know how much of that is, you know, what the factors are. It's sort of that black box thing again. Right, you just know the inputs and the outputs. So, yeah, great conversation. So let's let's move on to the 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 lighted knock issue. So they're legal in most states now, right? And I used them last year for the first time, and I am in love. In love because I can see where my arrow goes. I mean, I, I know exactly where I hit the animal. Right. And especially with the Valkyrie kind of setup I have, it's a tiny arrow, tiny, like the fletchings are little. I shoot that thing 50. I can't see it. Right. 30 yards. I'm like I, we're right here in the shooting range. I'll shoot it down there and I'm like, which one, where is it? I can't find it. Yeah. Right. And lighted knocks, even during practice, I'm just like, ching, ching, ching. I know exactly where it's at. Yeah. I don't know at this point why someone wouldn't employ them in, other than cost. But if you have right. the, the income and you're really trying to maximize your efficiency, it just seems like a lighted knock gives you that much more advantage. So now you know, okay, I hit him in the chest cavity right. or I hit him too far back or I, I – you yeah, can then, knowing knowing that shot placement is huge for sure. It is in the yeah. recovery. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah, it just narrows it down. I don't think it gives you that. It, it it definitely narrows it down to where you're like, okay, I have a pretty good idea where I hit that animal. Now there's still going to be that tunnel vision thing that happens. Yeah, but we, it, we hear that all the time. Y- yeah, there's that tunnel vision yeah. thing where like guy will come like, no, I hit him perfect. You're like, but did you though? Because mm. there's been times where I've even thought I've done something and it's it's been different. There's that right. tunnel vision effect that happens um, in the heat of the moment where your, your brain just takes a bunch of pieces and creates a story. And yeah. it's like, okay, this is what happened. Yeah. Right? And so, but it gives you a lot finer, um, a lot finer this, idea. This year, uh, I took a shot at a moose at a long range and there was, I, I, I ranged him, got him to stop dialed my sight, you know, I came to full draw and then he ran a bit and stopped. And I'm like, all right, I don't know how far he is. Right. There's, he's at the edge of my range. He's a big target. Right. So I put the pin high on his back and I was like, okay, I mean, at the very least I'll, I'll just miss under him. Right. Right. Um, but I'll left and right. I, I assume I'm going to be solid. This is a good shot angle. Everything's perfect. I took the shot arrows, perfect i'm like oh he's dead he's dead he's dead and then you know how it is on those long range shots it just just the last second the last second it just just dies right right? just drops well it drops and it just goes right under him just barely under under the brisket there and then but i was able to see my arrow and know that i missed him right just i knew instantly i was i shot under him and had i not had the lighted knock 100% 100% I'd have wondered if I hit him or didn't hit right. him. I wouldn't have known. And it was all tall, tall, like nasty brush. You're talking British near Columbia up real north. Uh, and there was no way I was going to find the arrow. No right. way. It was, yeah. It's that place. And, and so you're, I'm sitting there going, okay. And it's all rainy and so rain's coming down and, and it's muddy Blood is hard to find as well, unless right. I really. If you hit him, him good, yeah, yep. right. But to know that I didn't need to spend the next half day, full day, trying to see, trying to track, trying to put the scene together and see if I wounded him, and now I have an obligation to keep chasing, just to know I missed, I missed, I missed. You know, right. it was so liberating, and I can tell you from earlier experience for for those that watched. You know, I shot a bull with Corey Jacobson, and uh, and I, I we never recovered that elk. We tracked him nine miles and never found him. Jeez. And it looked like uh, I just hit him low. It was hard to tell. But 
we could, I couldn't tell where I hit him because I didn't have a lighted knot because they weren't legal. Right. And so I'm like, gosh, I, I have no idea where I hit him. Maybe, maybe it was here. Maybe and it was only 35 yards or so, right. 40 yards, 45 yards. Yeah. I, and it, that was frustrating. And so we had to go and try to replay the video, replay the video. And that's if you have a, that's if you videoed it. Right. If not, you're just trying to play it in your mind. And, and then I literally had no idea where I hit him. None. Until we watch video and it's, so that's where, um, to me that is, it's just so beneficial to know. Right. Yeah. I, I would agree. I think the number one reason is just to know that shot placement, you know, but there's with, with the light of knock. So you, there's a lot of drawbacks and guys get very frustrated with them because they'll go spend, you know, they'll go spend their hard earned money to buy a, a three pack of light of Knox and, you know, they break those in the first week and they're like, well, I'm done. I hear that all the time. Guys will try them. They're like, ah, I love them, but you know, they keep breaking them, and I can't afford to keep replacing these over and over and over. And so they get frustrated and just quit shooting them. They'll go back to a standard knock. So let's talk about the specifics of lighted knocks. So what what are the what are the cons? What are the what are the issues you guys run into in the shop, practically speaking, with lighted knocks? With most of them, it's just a durability issue. Hundred percent durability. Yep. They just yeah. they break too easy, you know, and so it you know that that adds a like a lot of money to a guy's setup. And so mm-hmm. you know, I tell guys like I'm all for spending money on archery gear. Like I geek out over that, but yeah. I got to see a good return for that. And so the problem is, every time I go to a light of knock, it's like, yeah, it was cool, but you know, the reliability is a yeah. tough one. It's, it's, it's like, I, we've worked with how many vendors now of lighted knocks, right? Not to mm-hmm. pick on any of them, mm-hmm. but we've done this one, this one, this one, that one, this one, right? Just to see which one would finally be reliable. And I, I've, I've yet to find a perfect lighted knock. That's super, super reliable. Um, so then it's like, okay, do you go with the one that's the easiest to just replace and use and and just keep replacing it or do you go with the really expensive one and and take the time and the money to set it up correctly but then when you break it you're like freak like that was expensive and so the the reliability factor sucks if i go and i buy a lighted set of lighted knocks generally three of them like 25 bucks for for three right i go buy three packs of those there's a good chance that some of those out of the package are going to be finicky and not even work. Some won't even turn right. on. Some like kind of like they'll turn on, but as soon as they hit the target, they shut, shut off. Back off yeah. S- some of them die quicker than other ones. It's like some run off of magnets, some run off of inertia, some run off of the actual knock being pressed into the arrow a little bit to then contact. There's there's so many okay. different versions. All of right. Them. Oh, so, so, okay. <laughs> so I've only used the one right. set right. up. The fire knock? The fire yep. knock. Yep. So if you guys had the money, what is the knock you're going to use? Fire knock. Okay. Yeah. Hands down. Yep. yep. They, okay. The thing that, you know, you tell a guy about a fire knock is he hears that first initial price and he's like $60 for three. And I'm like, yeah, and that doesn't include batteries. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, but it is the, for a guy yeah. that's going to fully commit to shoot a lighted knock system. It's the best investment you'll make, in my opinion. And and the reason being is, you know, it is an interchangeable system. So if you crack the knock, the, the light and the battery sit so far down in the shaft, most of the time those are fine. You just you can replace the knock. It's the, as far as I know, it's one of the few only light to knock systems on the market. You can it do is. that. Yeah, you can replace it and change it out and change the battery out. Right. Um, and but, the battery seem to last forever. Yeah, really good battery life. Yeah. Um, I mean, once we once we talk a guy into using that system, he usually loves it. But one of the biggest things that that I like about it is most lighted knocks will will change your point of impact quite a bit over your standard factory knock, whatever comes in your shaft, right? And a lot of these new ones were it's just kind of nice instead of having to buy a specific knock for that arrow. A lot of them will come with bushings, so you buy one knock, you can run it in multiple arrows. But a guy will throw on like a three pack of lighted knocks and not switch out his factory knocks that he's been shooting and gets a different point of impact. And so it's like you either, in my opinion, you got to either fully commit over to it or nothing at all. But this, you know, dabbling in between, like, especially if you're hunting out west. Now, like, I've had times where, like, I'm going to Texas on a hog hunt. Mm-hmm. I can get a lighted knock to fly pretty much the same point of impact, you know, 40 yards and under, really no problem. Yeah. But it's those longer shots that affect me. And so, if I'm going to hunt with a lighted knock out west where I know I'm going to be shooting, you know, longer, 
I, I want everything to be consistent. I don't, I hate variables with my setup. And so mm-hmm. I think a guy that's going to commit to a lighted knock, he's, you, you're either all in or you're, you're out, right? right? Fire knock, in between. Yeah, fire knock gives you that option where you can do a lighted system, right? You, right. you put in the system, you run the battery, you run the lighted knock. Like you got a dozen arrows and all 12 of them are lighted knocks. But then you can pull out the light part. Right. And replace it with a practice knock. Yes, and get this. It's the same weight. same weight, length, yep. same knock fit, and so everything's the same. Yeah, yep. and we have a ton of guys that are do that. Where you know, because we get a lot of customers hunting Idaho, where you, they're still not legal to use up there. Where mm-hmm. we'll build six arrows with the practice, and the nice thing about the practice is, I think a practice kit, a three pack, is only twenty bucks. So you can buy two of those, build six arrows, and build six arrows with the lighted. And yeah, you're you're invested more into it, but now if you're, you're now you're, if you're going to go hunt Idaho, you know, say if you you know you, again if you're fully committed, and you build those six arrows with the practice ones that you can you shoot, lose, break them. You know, you don't feel so bad about it, right? But if you do jump the border and want to go hunt in a state where they're not legal, great. You don't have to change anything on your setup. Everything's tuned and yep. it's built for that. You just take your. But practice. then if you come back into Utah where we can use them, take your lighted knocks and throw those in your quiver. Yeah. So yep. that's the best option. I feel like. I've been able to run the Garmin Zero with different arrow profiles. So I have lighted knock profile and then one that's not, but that doesn't account for tuning. Yeah. Right. You want to still, the, the tune will change. And so you want to yeah. keep the tune. And so with a fire knock running that practice knock and the lighted, you don't change your tune. You yeah. can keep the same profile. In, in, in general, as I switched around with different arrows, different arrow weights, I know they're not tuned just right, but. Um, I was able to, I was able to get most of those different arrow combinations to fly just fine. Right. 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 And, and then I just go, okay, on this hunt, I'm running this, switch it on my site. Cause I had all, right. all, all sighted in awesome, for different yeah. setups. Right. So that's kind of handy with that. But the ideal thing is to have your arrows be perfectly tuned across the board and be able, I, I, you know, run the practice right. knocks and, with the uh, with the lighted knocks and um the the only thing I didn't like about the fire knock the part that annoys me is the setup. Mm-hmm. I was gonna go there. <laughs> it is a pain. It in is the, the ass. worst setup. It's the most time consuming, and you got to be real precise. The glue that you use, the depth that you set them to, you, you, you got to know how. You got to be set a nerd, up. dude. To yeah, to want to oh. do that yourself. Yeah. I've messed up many of arrows. Yeah, learning how to install these correctly. Yeah, you know, I go online yep. and watch his watch Dord's YouTube videos, but he guy's too smart for me, man. I have to watch <laughs> that video like he 10 talks times. fast. He talks with big words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's exactly. almost like, what? Well, slow down, redneck. Slow down. <laughs> and he, he's the d- owner of Fire Knock, yeah. the designer yeah. and the owner. Did yep. he work at NASA or something like that? He's pretty much a rock. Probably scientist. that guy. I'm not kidding. He's one of the smartest guys I've ever talked to. I mean, I think he was a NASA engineer. Well, yeah. I I think he was like something president like of Zebco Reels, and just when he's a kid, I don't like know. he, one of the smartest guys I've ever talked to. But the problem yeah. is he's. He's so smart that like everything doesn't go over my head, but it hits me about right here. <laughs> yeah. And so I have to, you know, call him a couple of times to finally get the concept of what he's talking about. But yeah. he yeah, built a good system. I mean it's yeah. it's a full on microchip switchboard, like it's a yeah, yeah. yeah. It's legit. It's, advanced. it's very advanced mm-hmm. for sure. So that's that's up here if you're going light and knox. That's what's cool about them too the is um, you know, they they work off inertia, right? Yep. With yes. that chip. So yep. as soon as you shoot they they just turn on without fail. They impact the target. They stay on, mm-hmm. uh, and then they stay on until I like just kind of tap them. Right. The knock in on something. There's no. I don't need a tool. I don't need no a, a tools. pin. I don't need. Yep. Hold it flat for ten or so seconds. Turn it over. Drop it. Mm-hmm. Tap it with a decent amount of force, and your knock shuts it off. Right. Yeah. So it's simple for that. The only thing that is, uh, I'm shooting such a small micro diameter shaft arrow that I mean, it's a small small knock. And in bright daylight, I can't see, I can't, I cannot see the light. Right. You know, it's just not bright enough. But generally, I mean, I can see a little bit, but in that case, I can still see the arrow usually, and I can actually see its impact. Right. But usually it's overcast or it's a little early morning, a little later evening, and and I can always really see it. But when I was in Texas and it was just blazing sunlight, I shot into the, the target, all the lights came on. And then I left, came back, pulled all my arrows, but didn't realize 
they were on. Right. Yeah. Just, they were new. Right. Put them in my case, you know, or just set them down actually. And they were on for three or four days. And, and, then, notice, yeah. and then I'm like, how come they're not coming on? Because I've run all the batteries down. <laughs> right. Well, that's my experience with light knocks. Every time I've tried them, it's like, Oh, hey, I was hiking around and it got knocked on. I didn't realize it. So I finally get that opportunity to shoot an animal. My yeah. light doesn't turn on. I was like, I have yet to have that experience <laughs> of sending a lighted knock through something and watching right. it happen. To See, me. that yeah. doesn't happen with fire knocks. No, they are the most reliable. Yeah. So it's like, it's a give and take with it. And, for and sure. let's talk batteries. Because sometimes with the other brands, you got to chuck them. It's just like just it's over. Them. Or no, mm-hmm. I tell guys to keep them once. Well, you know, if you're yeah. if they're gonna buy if they're gonna buy a standard pack of Knox, like just plan on the fact that you have to, um, you're gonna burn through those ones, right? right? Like you're yeah. gonna, those are your practice mm-hmm. ones. Once the battery's dead, great. Keep using it for keep the weight and the tune factor. The, the weight right? and the tune. It, it now turns you're into about your fire Knox. No, just any anything any. other than yeah, yeah. fire Knox. You replace the batteries. You're good. But a lot of your other ones where you can't replace the batteries, mm-hmm. once it dies, just leave it as your practice right. knock can, for the how weight. How much is a is a uh, is is a pack of three batteries? Fifteen bucks. So you can you can replace your batteries for pretty cheap. Right. Once, once you own a fire knock, as long as you never lose your arrow, it's just right. it's going to last. Right. Yep. Yeah. You yep. pull it out of one arrow and put it in the next. Yep. If you if you break, say like this one, I've got one installed. If I if I'm out and I break this shaft. Mm-hmm. You know, I can pop the knock out. I can pull all the internal components. The only thing that's hard to get out is there's a little post that gets epoxy down inside the shaft. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that's a little bit more difficult to get out. You can buy those for pretty cheap. But a lot of times what we'll do is we'll just cut the arrow shaft and take um, like that gold tip fact weight wrench and just pop, tap it tap it back out and nice. soak it in acetone, reuse it, and Try put to it in the next it. arrow. Yeah. So nice. a lot of these components we can reuse. On, so the initial cost is higher, but... As long as you're not, as long as you're not, lo- it's kind of like the Valkyrie. As long yeah. as you're not losing them, they're going to last you a very long time. Right. You know? Right. So, well, but, so one of the things I've heard in the past about knocks in general, uh, that often people build an arrow and they do not realize the importance of a good knock. And so they built this whole shaft. It's right. brilliant. It's beautiful. And then they put a cheap, crappy, junky knock on it. What, what does that do? Why is that bad? It has a much bigger effect on arrow delivery than what I think a lot of guys even realize. So, you know, especially, you know, if we're going to, we're going to pick on VAP for a minute here, their factory knock is kind of terrible, to be honest with you, because it's so long that the distance from the back of the shaft to where the knock groove sits, when you fire, that knock will actually flex inside the shaft and it can, it can create havoc for, for downrange groups or even paper tuning. So yeah, it, uh, the, your factory knocks, I know, you know, a lot of guys overlook that, that they're super critical for accuracy. And so, you know, another thing too, you I know, heard, uh, Randy Ulmer talk about that once. Yeah. You know, guys that go buy them from a store just in a pack, thinking nothing of it, throw it on there and they just can't get groups and consistency. Yeah. It, uh, you know, I, I think guys too, what they don't pay attention to is one, replace your knocks more often than you think. I mean that every time you fire that, that knock is in charge of absorbing all that energy and transferring it. So, one, replace it more more often than you think. And two, buy good quality knocks. Like, I know it sounds funny, but we've seen some of these knocks coming out of China now that are just the molds are terrible. And, and not only do, does the material matter, but um, how it fits on your center serving is super critical. And there's been some times where, we, you know, a guy will come in here and he's complaining about grouping. His group's all over the place. Well, We'll go to check his knock fit on the center serving, and it is so just, tight that mm, it it just, just create it changes the launch point every time. There's no consistency yeah. there, and I think you know with a lot of the not- lighted knocks we've tried, that's one of the biggest problems I think we we find is it's not the it's not the weight so much that changes it. Like at distance, weight will have an effect. It's how consistent the knock fit it's is. It's the knock fit on the serving is what is the biggest variable there, and yep. so. You know, guys don't pay at close attention to that. And there's been times where we'll just change the guy's knockout and then tightens his groups right up. So, right. yeah, that's that's one thing I think about, you know, with the fire knock. Dorge did a good job of that that knock, how it comes on and off that serving is. The knock design is good. Yep, it is. It's a, it's a good durable knock for yep. sure. So what's another uh, lighted knock that you might recommend to a guy? <sighs> Tying a flashlight on the back of the arrow. <laughs> Um, 
there's a bunch out there. The other two that we run um, that we have that we've done a lot with is Nocturnal and uh, the new. Um, Doesn't the Dudley new, use those? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Nocturnal and the the Spot Knock, I believe, is what this new Victory mm-hmm. this Victory one is. Um, uh, Nocturnal came out a while ago, and it was that hey, it was, a, it was they tried to simplify it. Right, there wasn't a whole lot going on. There's just a plunger inside the knock groove. Um, so when you'd clip it onto the string, fire it, the string would come forward just a little bit, push the plunger, set that Turn knock off. off right. Yeah. Um, but if no you microchips, no microchips, no, 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 no microchips. Um, just an old push plunger system. Yeah. Um, but if you would click this on too hard, you could actually turn that on by pulling it like heat of the moment. Oh crap! Stuff's happening. And you go and you slam that knock into your string. It could turn it on. Then does it turn off when it shoots? Right off the bat, no. It would stay on, but it would just maybe spook a game or yeah, something. Or yeah. you're drawn back. They and you see got a lighted, red dot out, lighted in the knock out in the trees, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, and then the way that their system works is once that plunger's on, you got to have a sharp object. They have a tool. Some people use pocket knives. Um, there's a little window on the side of that knock where you'd stick that sharp object in there, pop the plunger back up. Mm-hmm. into the knock groove and that's what turns it off right um and so it, it's very nice it's 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 convenient it's simple it's just a press fit design you don't have to worry about that knock sitting halfway out of your shaft or anything like that it just pushes right into the shaft but um the the downfall is is you, you do have to have a sharp object to mm-hmm. turn it off you got to get into that window um sometimes that plunger will be a little bit sticky sometimes you can't get it to come back out sometimes you you you, you fire it um, it doesn't turn on. Sometimes it will turn on, but then impact the target and turn off because there's too much slop in the plunger. I think once that once you've done it so many times, that's what happens, right? Yeah, it like just breaks it, down. Yeah, that, that just, on-off switch can only yep. be on-off so yep, many it times. Just, it just breaks down. But, I mean, it, it is a good knock, right? They're bright. They make them in a bunch of different colors. You're able to group with them. Y- yeah, as far as knock fit goes, it's a pretty decent knock fit. Like I said, you just got to pull it onto the knock, onto the string just, just ever right. so slightly, lightly. So that you don't Accent turn it on, it. yeah, when you're doing it. But overall, it's a pretty good knock. Um, but with this, this once you go down from fire knock, I don't care what brand it is, um, you, you're, you're going to find some that don't that don't turn right. on that that are kind of finicky, you know. And it's not to pick on them, but it's it's a thing when you're looking mm-hmm. at buying fire knocks or you're buying well, nocturnal or, or the, anybody. What's the price comparison here? Uh, price comparison for that, like Jay said, you're going to be just for the lighted components. You're like sixty five bucks, about sixty, sixty for for, for three, for three, and, and then plus batteries. Plus so batteries, batteries are not included. Then you got to buy yeah. the practice kit if you're going to buy practice kit. Twenty those bucks though, on right? that. So that's where it does save you a lot on the on the practice side of things. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Right. So With if these, you just got like six that were lighted and six that were practice, or even you know if you want to just run three lighted knocks and right. run the practice and like run all practice, nine practice. Right. Yeah, these yeah. guys, um, I think we sell them for like twenty five for three. Yeah. Um, is generally what they run, and it, it is it is it is it. There's no practice it's a lot version. Cheaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a lot cheaper. Um, but it's that that uh, that gamble that you're going to get when you buy them. Right. I think I'd rather run three. And then nine practice right. of the fire knocks, then versus twelve six or, or six 12 of these. Of those, yeah, right. And it, it, it's it's nice. It's a good knock. If it you're works good, good. Like me, you only need one. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> it's it's a durable durable knock. Um, it, it's one of the better ones out there because yeah. I do like the fact that it it's in the shaft. It doesn't okay. have to poke out. It doesn't have to do anything funky. It's in yep. the shaft. It's solid. Right. Um, the other one, uh, I was actually forgetting it because I think I stuck it in my pocket. We have two other ones. Um, this is from Clean Shop. This is called a knockout. Mm-hmm. Um, this one is a, a universal fit. So what's going to happen with this one is it's going to come as a, a 204 diameter, I think, right yep. out of the package. Um, so a, a, a five millimeter, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then it comes with a couple little sleeves that will go over top of it that will turn it into different a six millimeter yeah. arrow if you wanted to. Um, this one has a little bit different plunger system to where it's going to fit in the shaft all the way down tight. But the knock itself is the plunger. The whole knock is right. the plunger. So when you push and inertia shoots this on, that's what will push it forward, turns it on, right? Okay. Then to turn it off, it's a little easier. You don't need a tool. You can just usually take and put your fingernail in there if you got fingernails and pull and just pull that right. back out, right? So simple. But again, 
the whole moving component of the knock starts to break down, yep. starts to get a little bit finicky. Sometimes they're really, really stiff, and then you just got to push them really hard, and you can't pop it back out. You have to pull out your pocket knife and try to pry it back off. The other, you know, the other thing that I found with those two is when you're putting them into a 204 shaft, sometimes they they don't go in solid enough. So you fire it and it pulls on, then you go to pull it and the whole knock just yes, pulls out of the shaft. Yes, you got to tap it with some glue sometimes. So the tolerancing or rough up the edge to get yeah, some grit in the yeah, shaft. Yeah, the tolerancing's but, a little bit a little bit off, some fit tighter yeah. than others. So yeah, when you do go to pull this off, I've had either the whole knock come out Mm-hmm. Or I've actually had the whole part of the top of the knock pop, pop off, off. Yeah. and so then you're left with just the little <laughs> light. And so, gotcha. but same price. I mean, they're twenty four for. So with with that knock though, I shot that one a lot last year. Mm-hmm. Um, one, do not recommend it for guys with facial hair. Yes. It, what? Because it, it once the knock pushes in, it clips oh, okay. and then it grabs a beard hair yeah. and it rips it off <laughs> every single. And so if you're shot, into pain and you like that kidding. pain is oh, game, it was bad. yeah, yeah. I see, I still yeah. probably have a bald spot right <laughs> yeah. here because of those knocks. It'll so. it'll rip out a big yeah, old. I'm not piece. down with that. No, yeah. no. <laughs> right. But so you lost me. Yeah, <laughs> yep. But, I mean, I ran those last year, and for the price, again, they weren't bad. Yeah. We wanted to put them through the ringer, but one, one thing I would say is I ran those in. Uh, I was running that out of an Easton. Uh, hex shaft uh, with the, with that bushing, and I was pretty impressed because I took that out to fifty yards and was shooting. I was shot three arrows with you know s- the standard knock, the H knock, right, and a shaft with that. And at fifty, it grouped consistently with with my factory knock. knock. Fit so is I, good. Knock, knock, yeah, the I knock, think the knock on fit this is good. I like better than the yes the knock yeah journals. knock fit okay. on that is yep. is cleaner off the string, fits a little better, more consistently, and, and then. Okay. Then the nocturnal. And what was that one called? This guy. Mm-hmm. This is the uh, knockout. knockout. Clean shot. Knockout. Clean shot yeah. builds it. Um, it's called the knockout. Okay. Yep. Um, and what about the victory one you were talking about? This guy we just got in. Um, so I, I've been playing with it a little bit. Same kind of system. Comes with a couple different sleeves. Universal. Um, straight out of the package, this one actually will come in a one six six or yeah. a four millimeter. So it goes straight into the VAP, straight into the the blood, the X the, impact. Yeah, yeah, the X impact that you're shooting. Um, but this one's a little bit different, where your knock groove itself doesn't have a plunger in it. The plunger is kind of tucked on the outside, also inertia driven, but nothing really contacts that plunger other than just inertia. Um, it's just far enough out of the, the knock groove to where you can click it on really hard. It's not going to not turn it on. You just shoot it. You just shoot it, and it then it'll take this bit. little collar here, and it shoves that forward. Right. lights up the whole knock. Um, also designed to just grab and turn off. Um, okay. So you can just put your fingernail in there, grab it, or your fingers hmm, if you got that tight. It's easy to turn on and off. Yeah. Fit-wise is nice. Knock fit's good. Well, knock fit yeah. is clean. Um, it's a little bigger more similar to the size of a nocturnal. Okay. And so if you're running a a standard knock that, say, like you're running a, a victory arrow, right, and mm-hmm. it's got a, a standard knock, they're a little bit smaller. So where you have your loop and your serving, if you have any tied knock sets, you might have to adjust those knock sets to fit okay. this knock. Yeah. Um, but it's once you do... It's a little wider. Once, yeah. It's a little wider. Yeah. But it's not tighter, it's just wider. So when you go through and reset your knock fit for this, um, it, it works really well. It, it's clean, comes off clean. Um, I fired these a whole bunch. A couple of them were a little stiff at first, um, but now it's just as simple. You just grab it and turn it on and off. Hmm. Pretty cool. I mean, the knock itself looks really robust, non-battery interchangeable, so it's just a fixed. It is what it is. Okay. Once it dies, you just run it as, price, a, as price. a practice knock. This one's actually a little bit cheaper. You're, or you get a benefit. It's the same price, but you get four for the price of the other three. guys is three. Right. Yeah, okay. so you're twenty five so bucks. Get one free. Twenty five yeah. bucks for four. And do those strictly pretty? It's, it sounds like they'll fit on any arrow shaft. Yes. Yeah. You. You. Your, your general shaft, six millimeter, five millimeter, four millimeter. They're not just made for victory. No. Right. Yeah. They'll nope. run. They're, they're nope. universal. But one thing that I did like about that is the housing itself seems to be one of the most durable. Just Looking at where the battery housing is sitting inside. Yes. Looks and, robust, ro- very and, robust. Push, you know, the, push that green collar and then just pull the green collar. Yeah. Think, you don't think that'll grab your beard? I haven't shot that one yet. I haven't <laughs> had it happen yet. And I, I mean, I don't have the, I don't have cool beards like you guys. I got little baby hair. <laughs> That's some peach fuzz. I got yeah. baby hair, but the knockouts will grab it. Yep. 
this does not. Okay. So um, okay. advantage, advantage for you, it's, sir. One <laughs> thing I do like about that new victory is, uh, you know, when we tried to run lighted knocks, especially in a one six six shaft, that's where we had, I would say, the most problems. Like no one, in my opinion, made a good G diameter knock except for fire knock. Fire knock by okay. by far, in my opinion, the best. Now. When you started running bigger shafts, like a 204 and bigger, Fine. that's that's when some other knocks, I think, were because of the durability aspect. Okay. But again, cool. that, that new one, I think that design, so I mean, it's new, but I think it's going to be, it looks really solid where you're not going to, some of those other ones, you go to push them in that, that 166 shaft and the dang battery system just breaks. You can snap it in half. Yeah. It's very flimsy because yeah. it's got to be so small to fit. This one's a lot more robust. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about you know, this kind of extreme FOC situation. Every, you know, when you're building something, you're trying to attain that heavy FOC, is something like the amount of weight you got to put on the front compared to the amount of weight you put on the back. You you can sh- actually get a, a greater FOC, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can increase FOC more by reducing weight on the back correct. than you can by adding weight to the front. Mm-hmm. So here we are adding weight to the back with right. batteries and a lighted knock. So if you're if you're trying to manage that, right? Because you're trying to make your overall arrow light enough to get some good speed, speed right. but still have a good twenty percent or higher FOC. W- which one of these knocks has that lightweight in the back? W- how does that play a role for you? They all are going to add weight. Yeah. It, it, it. I think the knockout, the that one's the lightest. I think the it's knockout, 21 it, grains. 21. Yeah, and these they all kind of go up from These there. are both 24, depending on the sleeve you put, anywhere from 24 to 26. Okay. This guy's usually 24 to 26. Um, the fire knocks? The fire knocks. I haven't that, weighed those yeah, yet. Yeah, well, I don't think his package is correct because I weighed one the other day with a customer, including, I mean, we're talking everything, the, the, the whole the whole thing, okay. and it was heavier than what he had stated on the package. Okay, because uh, we were concerned about that. Going, mm-hmm. you know, hey, if we're if you're running FOC and we add another thirty grains of weight back here, well, you have to run that much more weight up front to get that FOC to now pull forward. Right. So, yeah, that's uh, it can be a disadvantage, especially if you're trying to control total arrow weight. You know, and so I know on one of my setups, uh, I opted not to run a lighted knock. Because I would lose my my FOC right without going to an, a stiffer spine, which then made for a bigger head, and then started making my arrow trajectory be just uh, too heavy suboptimal yeah. from what I want to. Yeah, run. there's that happy medium balance. Well, and typically when you add weight back here, it stiffens the arrow shaft up. It'll act stiffer with more weight in the rear. But uh, so you know, may, maybe you wouldn't have to necessarily jump up an arrow spine. Um, but you definitely have to run the the weight to get that FOC to pull forward. Weight. So, you know, it's not you know I tell guys when you when you're running this, you're not just talking. If you're trying to keep your FOC up, you're not just talking adding thirty grains. You're adding sixty grains because, again, now you're trying to offset that up front. Right. So, yep. yeah, that can be a disadvantage if you're. If That's you're trying the to keep give that and up. take, yep. right? If you're going to run full FOC and your goal is FOC. The lighted knock's going to steal a little bit of that for mm-hmm. sure, and so you got to. You I still be okay able to that. attain it just fine with my my RX one, mm-hmm. just not with my carbon defiant. Yeah, and then I just wasn't real slow, and yeah. I just didn't want to go that slow. I all I could have, you know, but right. but I I like the speed I'm getting. Yeah, and some guys come in and go, you know, I don't I don't care what the speed of my bow is, just yeah. I want this heavy of an arrow, but. A lot of times what I would do is, you know, for years, I, I would take my bow set up and I would, I'd say, okay, I want to run between 290 and 300 feet per second. And I would shoot different weight arrows out of my new bow to see at my draw length and poundage, mm-hmm. then kind of see, okay, well, this is how heavy of an arrow I can run, but keep the speed. And then I would go look at, you know, different arrow build options and go, okay, what, what arrow can I build that's going to keep me in this weight range so I can keep my speed, but still be stiff enough and all that. So yeah, we, we've done that for a long, long time of trying yeah. to find that balance because, mm-hmm. you know, I've told guys for years, I'm, I'm terrible at judging distance. And so right. if I get too slow, I don't, <laughs> that the arc and trajectory of yeah. my arrow. We're I've no Levi too. Morgan. I can't yeah. judge like that guy, man. Yeah. That guy can judge. Yeah. That's, I, that's where. Two two eighty, 
Yeah. I like to stay above 280, somewhere in there, yeah. 280 feet per second. Tunable, think, controllable I think, speed. I think my other bow uh, is 278. Uh, and I mean, Do you, I is like that just, is that your, your, your personal sweet spot for speed? Yeah. Just 290, 280, 290 really? in, that, in that. I like that, but yeah. that's just where I'm able to get it to tune. Well, I'm able to get it to shoot. Well, like it's yeah. pretty flat. I right. Mean, you know? And so it's kind of funny cause I hear a lot of guys say that like, you know, Hey, that 280 is, is that's the mark. That's where I mm-hmm. want to be. And, I think if you tune your bow well, you can go faster. No problem. I mean, I think it's, it's, but I've heard a lot of guys say once they're going to 95, 300, now they're spending a lot more time tinkering with trying to get it to, to tune. Right. Shoot. Variables get, variables get. The faster you get, I think it starts to get trickier and trickier. Yep. Am I wrong, Jeremiah? Well, yeah, it's just <laughs> <laughs> to a point. You know, now, if you have a Formula One car or you have an Indy car, right? They go real fast, but the aerodynamics of that car are really top notch. So right. that speed is very controllable. Yeah. But if you just took a Geo and threw a bunch of power <laughs> in it and wanted to go 200 miles right. an hour, the, the wheels are going to shake off, right? So yeah, you got to be careful with speed. I just like I look back and go, you know, when when some of the guys out there that I hear say, you know, 280. Uh, you know, you got like Darren Cooper, you got yep. uh, Randy, Randy Olmer's Olmer. a big fan of that. There's a ton of guys that are in that 280 range. And, and I'm like, well, I shot fixed blades at over 300 feet per second mm-hmm. and had phenomenal success. Matter of fact, that setup I keep talking about from last year, mm-hmm. uh, that was that era of 436, I, w- I want to say it was, I want to say it was over 300 if I remember right. I think and so, you were 303. And I was still shooting a fixed blade, yeah. 80 yards. So I just, I'm like, I, I, I hear a lot of guys say that and I'm, I'm you know, but I'm like I've had I've had good luck stabilizing and still shooting good tight groups at speeds quite a bit faster than yeah. that. So Your bow's you, also a lot better tuned than I was gonna say. A lot of guys probably just they're not you. They're not able right. to get it all tuned and dialed. The shooter right. as well, too. I mean, you gotta have you gotta well, make a good yeah. shot. And sometimes when you get I feel like when you get lighter and lighter, you know, the speed's up, you can be, have a louder setup too. Yeah. That is true. That is um, true. Loud, loud, on the definitely. Veins, it, 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 louder with the bow, right. like just everything. Yep. Quieter, the heavier your arrow, the quieter your bow is going to be. And it's drastic. Like it's, yeah. you get up over 450 and I can, I can audibly hear a big difference in the way that yeah. my bow sounds. I think my sure. overall arrow right now is 510 grains. Right. You know, I think, I like that arrow weight. Yep. You know, right. and I'm at 280 feet per second. I like that speed. Now, for me to run a lighted knock, you know, and to have a 20% FOC and, and all of that, um, you know, my arrow got pretty heavy. Right. <laughs> so I was just happy to stay right at 280. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you're running that heavy, that speed is actually, that's awesome. And you get the best of both worlds, but. You know, that's why when I was b- building my system, I went with that 300 spine aluminum collar with a 200 grain tip. Mm-hmm. And I think under, you know, I'm still under 500 grains. I'm pushing, I'm like 494. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that still allows me to run high 290s out of my RX3, I think is where mm-hmm. I'm pushing. 296, I would love to be shooting that speed. Yeah. I mean, I, w- I couldn't give would. it up. I couldn't fun. give up the speed. Like if I, if I see 280, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to miss it. Yeah. I got speed. Faster. Speed is nice. I mean, we know, we all know Tim Gillingham. He's all about speed, right? Yeah. I mean, but he's got the draw length. He can do it. He's, he's shooting speed, but he's also shooting a heavy arrow still. Right. And yeah. speed is good for certain situations and then it's bad for others. And so there's a happy balance. And I think 280 is a happy balance where, at least from Randy Ulmer's perspective, right, the guy's guy's a very good shot. He's killed a bunch of stuff. He shoots Mm -hmm. a lot of of animals where he he judges the obstacles. He knows with a 280, it's good enough to lob over some obstacles and drop in if it needs to, but it's also fast enough to get under stuff. Where if you're shooting where there's brush from the bottom up, Mm -hmm. right, and you're trying to kind of, okay, that bush is at this distance, he's 
a little bit beyond it, I want that arrow to come up over and drop in. Yep. Speed sometimes in that situation, had if that, it's going too had, flat, yeah, that you're hitting once. the top of that yeah. brush because it's so flat, right. you can't aim on and have your arrow arc over. <laughs> it's like, so, right? that, you're starting to get real Yeah, nerdy yeah. <laughs> real, like, we get nerdy. you got to think of that. If you're Ryan Lampers, you're like, just get the 35 yards. Yeah. Like, this right. is just silly. I mean, like, all this talk is This silly. stuff just, is retarded. Just get but 35 again, yards and kill I'm not it. Just be a ninja. I can't get to 35. Just be a ninja. I had to learn how to shoot them at 65 that's, right, that's yeah. my deal right and that's one thing i always i always joke about too um at the end of the day you gotta because i'll have someone s- complain about a dude that um that that routinely kills animals at 85 yards mm-hmm. you know i'm like look that's that guy he's he's 120 pounds overweight you know, right. he's a fat dude. He can't climb the mountain. You know, he's not very <laughs> sneaky. He's really clumsy. Right. But that guy can shoot the lights out. Right. Why do you expect him to be, let's say, like a Ryan Lampers ninja guy? Why? Why when his skill set is way over here on right. this end? Right. And then I don't expect, you know, South Cox, uh, you know, he... He just gets right next to right. him. And she yeah. shoots, shoots him with the recurve. Right. And shoots yeah. him with the recurve. I know. It yeah. makes us look bad. Yeah. He's yeah. like, it's all just about getting close. <laughs> yeah. But that's his skill set. Right. You, you know, want me to be sneakier? Well, I want you to be a better shot. So exactly. Like, yeah. I, I feel like you quit trying to be like other people. Be like you. W- yeah. What are your natural abilities? Yeah. What is, what you got to know that threshold too, right? Because you throw these some of these slider sights on guys' bows, and they're shooting groups to 40. They've never pushed that limit, but situation happens where animal comes out. They're feeling frisky. They're like, hey, my sight will go that far. All I got to do is just slide it to that distance, and they lob arrows. Mm-hmm. That's where that, that gray area is, right? If you can go out and consistently prove that you can shoot 70-yard um, shots, right, yeah. in adverse conditions, then you got to know what your ethics boundary is. Yeah. Right. And I yeah. mean, for, for us out West, sneaky or not, there's so many factors in the terrain that we hunt, the high alpine, the wind, other eyes, 67 yard shot. If, if it's a good shot, I'm going to take it. Right. Right. So yeah, that's, that's close for out West. Right. Right. Like, yeah, that that's what guys don't realize. It's now that's of, mule deer elk yeah. are different. You're in timber. You're, they're generally closer, but I mean, I'd, I'd say, you know, I tell customers, Mike, my, my I, I'd say I don't think I've ever shot an elk over sixty. Most of the time, it's sixty yards and under, and so yeah, you know, I can get away with a little bit more. I can shoot, you know, fixed plate broadhead, all that, but it definitely changes once you cross over that sixty yard mark yep. and start pushing the distance out there. But you know, I, I tell guys, you know, especially new customers are coming in. You know, if you want to be a, an effective Western States bow hunter, my opinion, you better be able to shoot sixty yards. Yeah, if you can't shoot that sixty yard mark. You're you're just limiting the amount of opportunities you're going to have, and that was my first year bow hunting. Like I didn't have a good coach, I didn't have good equipment. Like right. I felt good mm-hmm. to forty, and I could not tell you how many. I was young and dumb then, and would yeah. probably hike in a place I shouldn't, but I couldn't make a f- over a forty yard shot, and so I tried to sneak in closer, and then I'd blow them out time after time. Yeah, after but you time. knew that, and you weren't just right. lobbing sixty yeah. yard True. shots. Right. Un- well, and with, with today's well, with the, uh, today's equipment and right. and knowledge and what's available out there, there's really no no reason. It's like sixty yards is the new thirty. I would agree. You know, yep. in today's with today's advantages. Yeah, I mean today's bow setups. I mean, granted, I'm, we're not promoting. Hey, everybody, go out there and shoot seventy yard shots at stuff. But if you can go out there, like say you're a whitetail guy, right, and mm-hmm. you're back, you're back where you're not shooting a bunch of distance. But if you can go back to the house on the farm or whatever and practice 60 yard shots, yeah. then when that 30 yard shot comes yeah. into play, you're cold, you're tired, there's adverse conditions, there's wind, your group size on a really good day, right? At 60 yards, you're doing really well. That makes your margin of error even that much better when you're on a bad shot, right? You're, you're going to open up a little bit. Yeah. I don't want my bad shots to be, you know, my good shots to be here and then my bad shots to be even wider. And yeah. so... Yeah, after I did 60 uh, heavy thrusters yesterday and 60 pull-ups, chest-to-bar pull-ups, strict, um, yeah, I could shoot well last night. It was really right. it was really frustrating. <laughs> I was, right. I, I was not building my confidence right. as I was like – Then your effective so yardage hard. comes in. And, and uh, often, though, I like to try that just to keep myself realistic – 
keep myself somewhat humble, uh, you know, because you'll get out there hiking three, four or five days in a row. You'll be right. exhausted. You'll be tired. And here comes a shot, you, you know, and, and you're over here in the wind. You're trying to stabilize just because in the perfect conditions, you execute these great shots. It right. doesn't mean that you do yep. when you're, when you're, when all these other conditions come in, come to bear. So it's not, you know, I realize after, you know, doing all of that, that lifting and stuff yesterday, man, I was smoked. Right. And Those I stabilizer just, muscles are. Yeah. Your gone, effective gone. yardage could have been 70, but now maybe it creeps in a little bit. I had a hard time at 40. You know, <laughs> yeah. Like, Hey, maybe it creeps into 20. I could get it in there. I could get it in there, but it was yeah. just like, I just, especially with that surprise release. Yeah. I just, I just couldn't float it in there. You know, yeah. a lot of things we tell guys, if you're doing that, like if you're still shooting, were you shooting a pole tension release? Or what? I was shooting the thumb button. You're, thought you're, you're still executing it. the right way. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of guys when they'll get to that fatigue point because they their their ability to aim is now gone. That's when it starts creating a ton of target panic because they're yeah. like, I can't hold that pin on that target for long enough. So as soon as that Drive pin by. there, <laughs> I'm sending it right. Yep. And yep. so, yeah, I, you know, which is kind of happening to me yesterday too. A few times, like, right? Okay. Well, and that's where you know we talked about those snowball effects with uh, mm-hmm. target panic. Like, yep. If you if you just went grabbed the aim, hinge and just yeah. started shooting with the hinge, as long as you're executing good shots, but yeah, if you're getting to the point where you're like, hey, I, my arms are tired and I can't I can't hold on target at forty, go into the distance where you can still your ability is still to aim, even if it's blank bailing at that point. Mm. So you're still getting the the repetitions, you're still building and working those muscles, but you don't want to create that that issue of the potential of starting a target panic because you're, you can't hold and you start punching. And for some guys, like I know we've talked about in yeah. the past, you, you're miraculous and don't, you fight through that, right? right well, right. that's not a lot of guys. And so, yeah, if you're, if their ability to do that, I just get, get close and still execute good quality shots, but not so much worry about the aiming, you know, blank bell at that point. Yeah. So. Yesterday was depressing. Like it was physically, <laughs> I just, you know, I was smoked, right? My arms were, my arms were smoked. And, uh, and yeah, there was a couple of times where I punched it and just to drive by, right? you know, it's like, this doesn't work. And I found that in, in that situation, I really had to just be surprised, just, just hold, 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 yeah. hold and let it go. Otherwise, and, and I still wasn't great, but I was only like 40 yards, right? but right. I was still in a kill zone right. if I did that, even shaking all over, you know, and being unstable. But if I punched it. You could end up in the top left corner, off right. target completely. <laughs> like, yep. it was it was worse when I was that blown out right. yeah. than if I just let it float sloppily and let it go. Yep. Kind of weird. There you go. So, yeah. Well, guys, it looks like your shop's going to open here in a few minutes. So we got to we got to get you back to work. So. Yeah. But all that. <laughs> Yay. Thanks for uh, coming on the show. Uh, f- people can find you guys down here at Wild Arrow here in North Salt Lake. Yes. What North Salt it? Lake, Centerville. Centerville. We call it Centerville. It all, it all kind of flows together though. You can't really yeah. separate one from the other. So, okay. Yeah. But yeah. Right on. Uh, thanks for tuning in folks. We appreciate uh, all your support and uh, give these guys a, a follow on Instagram and come on down to the shop if you're in the local area. Uh, hit them up for their expert knowledge. Thanks, guys. Thank you.